Hello and welcome along to the latest episode of the Manchester is Red podcast from the Manchester Evening News. I'm today's host, George Smith, and I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by our Chief United writer, Samuel Lutkus, who's back from his week's holiday. Samuel, good to see you. How are you? Yep, very well, thank you. Very well. Not um, not bad at all. Feel, feel recharged anyway. It was uh, it was nice to have have a week off. I think my my work phone might have only been uh, might have only been left on for maybe maybe a combined period of of, of an hour last week. So uh, it was very very unusual. But uh, tr- trying to uh, did my utmost to to decompress. No, oh, that's very good to hear, and obviously good to sign off with a dramatic win the day before you started your your that week was holiday. The wrench. Which- it yeah, was, that, that was it. Was a wrench not being able to to cover the the immediate twenty four hours after that. I, I, I'm I'm loath to to not work in Mondays. So uh, I, yeah, although I was pottering about somewhere, um, not 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 too far from where I live, I'd have I'd have probably much rather have been um, working on that Monday and uh, doing doing the follow ups on a pretty extraordinary game. Yeah, fully understandable after the drama that happened a week last Sunday afternoon. But uh, moving forward and looking ahead to the restart of the Premier League campaign this coming weekend, we are going to discuss that upcoming game at Brentford. We're going to look at how things have evolved on the international break. Koi Mainu getting his England debut at the weekend and touch on a few other subjects as well. I'm going to start with a story that you've written this morning, Samuel, on your return about uh, Eric Ten Hag's future in the sense that Omar Barada is going to potentially have a significant say in a possible change that could come this summer at Old Trafford. You wrote a piece a few weeks ago that Eric Ten Hag was in a position of uncertainty ahead of the summer following the change and the arrival of Sir Jim Ratcliffe and the Ineos group. And Omar Barada is going to be coming in in the summer. And it sounds as though, according to yourself, he's going to have a, a big part to play in a potential change that could change the complete culture and the, the direction of the club moving forward. He'll have a big part to play at Manchester United uh, beyond the managerial situation. But from... From Sir Jim Ratcliffe's perspective and the Ineos perspective, they would much rather delegate those decisions to the the football experts, which is why they they want Dan Ashworth, which is why they're getting Omar Barada, and they will be uh, probably inevitably getting Dan Ashworth as well. the The difficulty, of course, is that these guys their their start date is in the case of Barada, he will start in the summer officially. He has been conducting. Uh, dis- discrete meetings, you know, maintaining contacts, trying to get, um, you know, tr- to ensure that he hits the ground running when he is formally, I, I don't know if he'll be paraded or unveiled, but f- ahead of his official start date, he 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 wants to be as as prepared as possible for it, and it could be it could be quite a hectic um, start as well at Manchester United. It's it's very very rarely um, quiet at Manchester United, as we all know. But where Barada has this, you know, as, as ample experience of dealing with football matters at City and the the role of a chief executive in a company, it's always going to be very important. There's always going to be an element of delegating. But in comparison to Richard Arnold, say, or or Ed Woodward, he's he has got the football expertise where he can have a big say and, and a significant say on any managerial change uh, should it happen. Of course, Woodward was the kingmaker a number of times. When it came to the manager's position at United, but he did not have a football background, which is why there was always a lot of constructive and uh, justified criticism of him in his role, whether he got things right or whether he got things wrong, because the structure wasn't right. And th- the structure at United, they they do have a football director, they do have a technical director. Um, th- those roles are, are going to are going to change somewhat, of course, with a, a sporting director coming in. It remains to be seen if John Murta will actually stay at the club. It remains to be seen if Darren Fletcher will stay as technical director. If he does stay, I'd imagine it would be a, a different role or the, the, the definition of of that technical director role would, would be tweaked because it's not, it's not your usual technical director that people associate with, with at a football club. He's, he's almost like a conduit between the first team and and the academy and he is involved on on match days but going back to the point of a possible managerial change what one of the reasons and I've I've never thought there's been a point in the season where Tent Hag should have been sacked I've said that there's been a a credible case uh, in in January uh, to to possibly have have done it there but I, I didn't think they should have done it and I wrote that as well and I don't think any of the dedicated correspondents have have outright done a piece that the Manchester United manager should be sacked. 
And one of the reasons for that, beyond the results, always been a bit, in, not not a bit inconsistent, very inconsistent, but there was a power vacuum. And to an extent, there still is, even though you've got Sir Dave Brailsford going to the majority of matches. Ratcliffe is watching on. Ratcliffe has said an awful lot already. I thought it was quite interesting when he did his podcast with Geraint Thomas last week. I don't think they even touched upon the managerial issue, which uh, you'd, you'd imagine that may have been something that they discussed before they they went on air um, so that they wouldn't you know, d- dwell on that at all because I don't think... I don't think that really would have helped Ten Hag if you had one of Manchester United's co-owners discussing his posi- his position in in great detail, and and he was he was reluctant, very reluctant to do that with us when when we spoke to him at the Ineos offices in in Knightsbridge last month. And the way things have gone in the last few weeks, as as I said to some working uh, who works at United before the before the um before the Everton game if you win the next two games you go into the spring internationals with a spring in your step and that was a hell of an understatement given the manner of that Liverpool win and I I'd hesitate to say that the position in the Premier League table is auspicious but since they last won it played and won in the Premier League United Villa have lost both their games Tottenham were listless when they lost uh, at Fulham the other week as well when they got beaten 3-0 at Craven Cottage and United are nine points off fourth. I think they have a game in hand. Villa are wobbling. They've they've wobbled for a fair old while as well. They've had some good results along the way, but I think since that Boxing Day game against United, they've they've been a bit thrown by, or, or certainly they're not handling the pressure as as well as uh, as Unai Emery would have, would have wanted them to. And Tottenham are serial bottle jobs. Uh, they've they've shown that for decades. So there's there is still an outside chance United finish fourth. And look, they're they're going to be odds on favourites to reach a second successive FA Cup final, and as we've discussed throughout um, the season, and certainly in more recent months, if they were to finish in the top four and win the FA Cup, that that trumps that trumps last season because the FA Cup's a more treasured trophy than the League Cup, and of course, if they were to win the FA Cup this season, the likelihood is that they would be beating Manchester City in the final. Um, that said, Chelsea have have gone toe to toe with City twice this season and, and got two uh, creditable draws against them, but City will. You know, the, the chances are it will be another All Manchester FA Cup final, and the success whether the se- the season is a success or not, it come de- it could well and truly come down to that game, and that's another reason why um, there won't be a managerial change before um, before late May at the very at the very earliest. I think it's uh, fair to say. Absolutely. And I know you've said several times throughout the season, as you've just said there, the FA Cup is a much more illustrious trophy than the League Cup. It is a bigger prize and would undoubtedly count for more for Manchester United. Um, Looking forward, though, obviously, you've said as well in that piece that United want to get a settled structure in place. Dan Ashworth is more than likely not going to arrive at some point in the future. Omar Barada is going to come in in the summer. So it's certainly clear that Sir Jim Ratcliffe wants to get the house in order, get the the bedrock, get the foundations laid before committing to any decision that could could you know result in a big big change in the club's direction moving forward. Because for me personally, and I wrote this in a piece over the weekend, Eric Ten Hag has got far more right than wrong during his United tenure. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't disagree with that. I mean this this season until uh, until the Liverpool uh, win the other um, what was it eight days ago now. It, you you had to say it's it had been a, a bad season up until that point, and that's why there was so much riding on that that quarter final. And if they'd if Anthony hadn't turned and equalised with his right boot, then it, it would have been pretty tricky for for you guys who were working last week um, covering United because it, it would have felt like the season had, had had ended. Because I don't think anybody would really have had faith that United could could pick themselves up from from losing to Liverpool and, and finishing in the top four or even the top five, because of course there's the possibility that fifth will secure Champions League qualification. But that's that's the beauty of football. I mean that that one moment, that one goal, it changed the it changed the game completely. Liverpool were fortunate to go three two up in extra time with uh, the, the deflected goal from Harvey Elliott, not just because it was deflected, but United were playing better than them in extra time and United had an extremely strong end to um to the 90 minutes as well so 
that, that's how momentum swings in football and, and momentum swings in sport. They can be extremely drastic and unpredictable. And again, that's why that's why people are engaged by sport, why they love sport. And at the moment, in Hag's approval ratings, uh, they'll be at a season high because United have just beaten Liverpool in raucous circumstances. One of the, certainly, there was a video in the 90s release called Manchester United's Greatest Victories Against Liverpool and this was pretty much pre, pre-Premier pre League era. And um, if they wanted to do an update of, of that, probably on the streaming platform these days, then that, that game at the weekend, it would not only go in it, but it'd be one of the one of the top top ten, maybe one of the top five. Even it was you know, it was that huge, and that's irrespective of whether they that they lose to Coventry somehow in the semi finals. You're never going to be able to take the the sheer raw emotion of that day f- away from the supporters who are inside the stadium. I mean, it was pretty, you know quite a few of us were getting excited in in a professional capacity. I, I may add, still in in the press box, just because of how um, how exhilarating the drama was and. Uh, it, it was it was a real privilege to be able to to cover it, and of course, if you're the Manchester United manager and you're walking off after a win like that, you're going to be reluctant to leave. And when I left, Ten Hag was still ling- lingering, signing autographs, posing for pictures, and you couldn't blame him. You, you 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 probably would not want to leave the stadium, and he'd have been at the stadium for about eight hours that day. And of course, he goes off in the evening. He has a celebratory meal with his son and um, his, his agent in, in Hale. But he, he was done by eleven p.m. So he showed pretty uh, admirable restraint to have quite an early night. All things considered, I'm sure a few United fans would have had far later nights, given that it was also St Patrick's Day. And it, when you when you win a game like that, when you look at the position in the league table, that there's a reason why he is still in charge and. I think Ty said on on Friday's podcast that I listened to that United have won eight of their last ten past ten games and the, the two defeats. I mean, the, the Fulham one was a worse defeat because it's just you know, Saturday three pm home kick off against Fulham. Fulham can't even sell all their tickets. That's a game that you've really got to be winning, and that had been a really good month for United up until that point. So that was why it was such a such a galling setback. Uh, to have lost in that manner uh, when th- they were in such good form going into that game, most most teams lose at City. You know there were some uh, you know, worrying aspects about the performance, but United were quite spirited on the day. Um, they had a, they executed a game plan pretty well for the best part of an hour. Of course, you've got to do it for an hour and a half at the very minimum, but it wasn't wasn't the kind of derby that we've seen in recent years where you feel like there's there've got to be mass inquests and. It's it has an end of days feeling about it with United, and that's you know it has been a very erratic season from them in that they've had these wonderful moments, these added time wins against Brentford, Fulham, uh, Liverpool, um, Wolves as well. Uh, you know, that, you know, so there's there is some resilience about the team, even though there've been other occasions where they've been totally devoid of resilience. And you know, of, of course, Ten Hag has spoken about injury issues and he, he was still going on about some some refereeing injustices against Arsenal after the Liverpool game, which I, I don't think many people had much time for. And he doesn't really need to stoop to that. And the, the way he's conducted himself at the moment, I thought I thought against Liverpool, I thought he, you know, although there wasn't a great deal of strategy behind that win, when you look at the gap between the defence and the midfield in the third second minute, when you think of the forty minute meandering in the second half, uh, where they didn't get anywhere against Liverpool, but United had that desire and that emotion to to win the game. It was a game won on emotion and the adrenaline of it, and just doing your absolute utmost to get that win. And if the manager is able to extract that performance level because of those reasons from the players against a team as formidable as Liverpool, that tells you that he is still getting his message through and he is he's still got more than ample support in that dressing room. And that's something else that um that should also be pointed out because people get very sensitive about dressing room leaks. We've I don't think any of us, the dedicated correspondents, have said that he's lost the dressing room or the, the dressing room aren't behind him anymore. I've I've always stressed it's been a minority of players who have been unhappy or taken umbrage with certain things that he's he's done or, or have felt wronged by him. And that was evident again on 
uh, during the Liverpool game, the, the sheer performance level. Because I said, I don't think it was a great deal of strategy to that performance. I mean, the the absence of a defensive midfielder, it was vindicated with McTominay scoring, but look how United were exposed when Liverpool went at them towards the end of the first half and they didn't really lay a glove on them in the second half until the most unlikely of game changes emerged in Anthony. And I still go back to the wider point that if you're still able to elicit that performance level from from those players, particularly after they equalised to make it 2-2 and that rip-roaring end to the 90 minutes and then how well they did in extra time as well with that makeshift back four, that tells you that you know, you've got more than ample support in the dressing room. Absolutely. And I did mention in last Monday's podcast with our colleague Tyro Marshall, where I didn't actually touch on the, the late victories that United have secured in recent weeks. It showed the character. It showed that a lot of these players are willing to run through a brick wall for the manager. Um, and speaking of Ty, he did a piece last week where he said that no firm decision had yet been made on Eric Tan Hag's future ahead of the summer. And I think it's quite clear that there is no obvious candidate out there to come in and replace him. There's been several names linked with the job, of course, Gareth Southgate, one of the main in the last few days. But I think United almost, they, they could do more harm than good potentially than re- with replacing Eric Ten Hag, possibly. That, 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 that's an argument that a lot of United supporters would certainly um, present to those who feel as though that there should be a managerial change at the end of the season. I think the difference on this occasion is that they've got decision makers who won't they won't act on emotion. That wasn't the case with Ed Woodward, with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, who, who, who was essentially made permanent manager because of two results. The first beating Tottenham because it saw off the threat of Mauricio Pochettino and the second was beating PSG to qualify for the Champions League quarterfinals, which was a, ro- was a result that beggared belief, given that United started that second leg 2-0 down on aggregate. They had, I think, 10 first uh, senior players out injured or, or, or unavailable because Paul Pogba was suspended. And somehow they, they got through it. And it was difficult not to get swept up in the emotion of that. You saw it from Gary Neville that night, Rio Ferdinand that night. If you're a supporter, you'd have to have something wrong with you not to absolutely revel in in such a remarkable recovery. But if you're a properly run football club, and you actually have a sporting director or you've got some football knowledge on the board or among the power brokers, you've got to have someone who takes a step back and analyses a situation objectively. United didn't have that. They had Ed Woodward making the decision. And the following morning, he was getting mobbed at Charles de Gaulle Airport from supporters who were you know, urging him to appoint Ole Gunnar Solskjaer as, as permanent manager. And less than three weeks later, he was made the permanent United manager. And yeah, should, should he have been? Clearly not. But I think that had he had that decision been delayed until the end of the season, he probably still would have got it. Just by virtue of, I don't think their results would have been as bad as they were after he was made permanent manager. Um, but there were clearly issues there. Coming back to this situation, you're not going to have Sir Dave Brailsford or Sir Jim Ratcliffe or Omar Barada or Dan Ashworth. And you you have to imagine there are conversations going on there, even though a couple of those people just mentioned are not are not employed by Ban- by Manchester United officially yet. They're not going to s- decide right. He he's staying next season just because they've beaten Liverpool. They will not act on emotion, and that's the difference. Previously, um, not always the case with Woodward, uh, but of course with. Uh, and there are certainly similarities with Ten Hag beyond beyond their um, beyond their nationality. But Van Gaal, of course, was sacked two days after the final game of the season in 2015-16. And that had been coming because Mourinho had been lined up for a number of months at that point. But this, you know, th- with, with Ten Hag at the moment, it does feel like it's almost, it's more in the balance. And I mean that in, in as a positive for Ten Hag because I'd have said post-Fulham, post-Derby, it was probably more against him that he was going to be at United next season, but he has been able to restore that balance. But then you go back to that win against Liverpool and the manner of it, how extraordinary it was and the resilience and the you know, the sheer desire that United showed that day. But to make a decision on the back of a result like that and the way it pl- played out, you, you, you wouldn't be worth your salt. Your, your credibility 
as someone running a football club would go down the pan to do that. So Ineos aren't going to do that. It, it is, it's quite quite rightly, Ten Hag will get, barring an absolute disaster over the coming weeks, he will see out the season with United. And then you've got to look at the body of work over the course of this season. You can factor in last season as well, because it is relevant, undoubtedly, but more relevant is this season. And then you have to come to a, a clinical conclusion as to whether he deserves to be, uh, they deserve to stand by him. Uh, sorry, he deserves to be, to, to, to stay as United manager, or whether there's an alternative. And the problem that United have, if they did want to make a managerial change, is that, there, and I wrote this weeks ago, there is not an obvious, there's not an obvious candidate to replace Ten Hag. Um, I think if Ineos were to sack Ten Hag and appoint Southgate, they would lose credibility very, very quickly. Uh, Southgate, when he was actually made Middlesbrough manager in 2006, Sir Alex Ferguson publicly questioned it because he didn't have the qualifications at the time. And you could make an argument now that he does, still doesn't have the qualifications to be managing at Manchester United. I think it would be it would be a very, very peculiar move. And I know there's a clear link there to Ashworth and he has these supporters and obviously Dave Brailsford is a fan. But he is, you know, this This is not a golden age for English managers. Uh, in, Graham Potter, Gareth Southgate, they've, they've done laudable work, but not laudable enough to be managing the most scrutinised sporting institution on the planet. It just won't wash. It would be the one managerial appointment United have made post-Ferguson that wouldn't have general approval from the fan base as well, and yeah, you know, the timing of of, of the uh, you know the admiration of, of figures at Ineos and obviously coming out during a news vacuum. Like, it, it, essentially, it filled the void of the news vacuum of an international week. Um, it was it was bound to get tongues wagging and spark debates, and gave I'm sure it gave you guys a hell of a lot to write about. But when it, when you just look at it. The prospect of Gareth Southgate managing Manchester United—that's that is a sight that cannot be allowed to happen. No, I fully agree with that, and and I say that as a as a supporter of Gareth Southgate still in the England job. I think he's done a good job over the last six or seven years or so. Done well in the tournaments he's managed. He's done in. very good job, very good job. But, the, the starting point for England when he came in, when they what in in the summer they'd had that humiliating defeat to Iceland. You'd had the Sam Allardyce um, incident where he lasted one game and then he was sacked. Southgate was the under-21 manager. Given that starting point and the disconnect between England supporters and the national team, he's he re- he's reconnected them to the point that you know there's there's, there's a play um, about his 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 time as as the England manager um, because he's he's been that popular even though there was still a lot of um, fans who who. Do not find him to be particularly popular, but that's that's the polarizing element of, of managing England. As, as I completely agree with you, George, he's he's done a very very good job at, for managing a national team that hasn't won anything since 1966. But that's that's certainly not the cri- he's he he doesn't have the criteria to be then stepping into Manchester United. Absolutely not. No, definitely not. And that was going to lead me into my next point in the sense that, yes, he's done a good job with England. There's no doubt in that. He's restored the national pride in the national team, reconnected the the interest essentially in the England squad. But ultimately, he's not won anything as of yet. Obviously, the Euro's coming up this summer. But obviously, club football is a completely different kettle of fish. But managing a club of Manchester United stature is an even bigger different kettle of fish. So I think you're right, Samuel, in the sense that he's not really got the credibility to take this job. And Ineos have... They've gained a lot of credibility so far. So Jim Ratcliffe's hit a lot of the right notes, but appointing Gareth Southgate, he's, he's going to lose support, isn't it? If he if he decided to do that, it, absolutely. I mean, Omar Barada worked at Manchester City, who are best in class in terms of running a football club. Uh, Dan Ashworth has done brilliant work with with Newcastle, Brighton, um, the FA as well. Uh, as, in terms of sporting directors, he was always going to be high up the list of. Um, the ones that they would want, and then the, the, just the notion that Gareth Southgate would be the manager, it it just doesn't it's, it doesn't tally with the the appointments they've they've already made or they are going to make with with Ashworth. And if you want best in class and in international management, that still isn't Gareth Southgate. That is 
Didier Deschamps, and he'd be even more ill-suited to uh, to managing Manchester United. I don't think the the prospect of taking any manager from any of the national teams uh, should should just not be entertained. Uh, there's there's a very specific criteria that is required to manage United, and in terms of the permanent appointments they've made since Ferguson, I'd say only. Only I mean, maybe two, three at the very most of of um, you know have ticked those boxes, uh, and they'd be Van Gaal, Mourinho, and and Ten Hag, Moyes, and Solskjaer. Certainly, um, when you, when you look at those appointments in isolation, there was not there wasn't a great deal of logic about them. No, there was a lot of um, a lot of context to it, and of course, Solskjaer was initially the caretaker manager before he was made the permanent manager, and he did very well as caretaker. I think Moyes was always a mistake, and I said that at the time. I, I just couldn't fathom why someone was being considered for such a huge, huge role on the strength of them also being Scottish and also uh, an, an association with with longevity. But that was the mistakes Sir Alex Ferguson made, and now we come back to the current possible predicament of having to appoint a United manager and. You look at the options or who could be available and the standout candidate who would be available in the summer is not going to get anywhere near that role and that's Jurgen Klopp. And the, the I mean, the irony is that uh, when he came in the press conference room after Liverpool lost, there was a there was literally, he saw a sheet of paper that said contract on it um, above the, the Manchester United crest beckoning someone anyone to to sign it and he said is that for me uh so uh, unfortunately for Manchester United not because I, I suspect there are quite a lot of United fans that would have wouldn't mind having Jurgen Klopp there but um he's not going to become this this century's Phil Chisnell and make that uh make that switch from from one of those two clubs to the other club that's um I think that's probably going to be Phil Chisnell's record for for a long time yet left to come yeah, I think we can definitely uh, rule that one out before it even yeah. perhaps whispers of that begin to start. But that does conclude part one of the Manchester is Red podcast. Do rejoin us in part two, where we have a little look at United's midfield and reflect on Koi Menu's England debut. Welcome back to part two of the Manchester is Red podcast. Myself, George Smith and Samuel Luckhurst with you. And obviously, Samuel, the Liverpool game marked uh, an injury concern, another one before kickoff with Casemiro ruled out with the recurrence of a hamstring issue. Um, it felt logical at that time that Sofian Amrabat would come into midfield and replace him as the most likely defensive candidate to uh, take that void that he'd vacated. Eric Ten Hag went with Scott McTominay, as you mentioned earlier on, he did score the opening goal in that game. And of course, it does raise a few questions about where United go with their midfield ahead of Brentford. But more likely than not, McTominay is probably going to keep that spot in midfield, most likely against uh, alongside Bruno Fernandes and Kobe Mainu. Sofi and Amrabat's move has quite simply not worked out at all. No, and uh, it, it was it was an invidious position for Ten Hag to be in because there were there were cases for Amrabat or McTominay. And in the end, look, McTominay was that was a vindicated call in that he got a goal and he got an assist and he was involved in. Two other really good goal scoring chances. I mean, McTominay is a moments player. He's one, his fitness is one of the best in the squad. And you knew that on that pitch, if it did go to extra time, he's he's a player to keep on for the full two hours. I thought it was quite telling when you looked at the five players who who weren't substituted, the outfield players. Three of them have not are the only three outfield players who have not got injured this season, which are Dallo, Fernandez, and Garnacho. The other two, McTominay, who, as I said, is is an athlete. You just look at him; he's he's well built. I think doesn't Fernandez call him McTerminator, and th- there's good reason for that. And the other one is Rashford, who in recent years physically has has filled out even more and is a really strapping presence. And I'm, I'm sure some United fans are hearing listening to this and thinking, well, he doesn't run enough, so he should have been able to conserve enough energy for it but he put a hell of a shift in and and he is a he is a natural athlete so going back to the midfield issue when when it when it emerged that Casemiro was out of the Brazil squad then that meant he was obviously going to be out of the game 
you do think logically, well, Amrabat's the number six, and that's what Ten Hag said. We didn't have an alternative number six last season, so he can come in and play. But if you're going on form or contributions this season, then it's a no-brainer. It has to be McTominay. And, of, of course, McTominay came in, got his goal, should have made it 2-0. Then, of course, and I marked the, I, I even noted the time of it, and before I'd even pretty much noticed it, I think the screenshot was going viral of that gigantic gap that a jumbo jet could have fit between of the defence and the midfield in the 32nd minute. And that is the that was the sizable con to not having a defensive midfielder. Because I think at that point, Dallow even went into uh, came in as a makeshift midfielder, even a centre-back to try and keep Liverpool at bay and Fernandes had gone at right-back. And that's what I meant earlier about there not being that much of a strategy to that win, even though I'm sure Ten Hag and his staff would have poured through a lot of tactics with the players and there'd have been specific remits for the players. But watching it, it just looked like United wanted to do, as Jamie Carragher said, press high but have a low block. And it was exposed in that one moment. And they didn't. They didn't heed the warning shot either. Um, that was that was still at one nil, and of course they ended the first half two one down. And that's the paradox of United's midfield when Casemiro, who is a player who's not had a good season, is not there because there's nobody unless you're putting Amrabat in there. And let's face it, that's not necessarily advisable going off his form for United. But there's nobody who's going to occupy that specific role, and that was a problem that came to a head last season against Manchester City when they were 6-1 down with about 10 minutes to go. The midfield was Ericsson and McTominay. It was too gung-ho. They were they were steamrolled that day. The following week, Casemiro came in for his full debut and we all know how influential he was for United last season. And that is why, and I've, I've said it before, when it comes to recruitment in the summer, the most important position United sign for the team will be the midfielder to go with Kobe Mainu because that is going to have a huge, huge bearing on how they do next season. It's got to be someone who's durable, who's disciplined, who can have a, you know, can hit the ground running, who can develop quickly a very good rapport with Mainu, because Mainu has absolutely got to stay in the team as a starter. But for the run-in, it is a bit of a, it is a bit of a pickle they've got there, because essentially it's another player who... Is, is going to be missing just for his presence because Casemiro this season, as I said, he's he's not had a good season. He's looked isolated far too often. The amount of good games he's had, you could probably count on one hand. He's shown his age. If there's an offer that comes in for him in the summer that's acceptable, I think United have to accept it. But without him, they have that dilemma as to what what's the balance of the midfield going to look like. Now, maybe McTominay and Maynu can... You know, can get there. They can uh, address it in in circumstances that are maybe not as taxing as the Liverpool game. But we're in a run in here where there's a lot at stake in every match, and United have got to be at the top of their game if they're to finish in the top four and if they're to to win the FA Cup as well. And with McTominay, he's it seemed that he he's and I still think it is the case. Ten Hag has decided he is an attacking midfielder. And he's got nine goals this season, and he's done terrifically to get that um, to get that haul, particularly when he was essentially up for sale in the summer. But then you go to the Liverpool game, and all re- and you're looking at it, and you're thinking, well, is he going to be the one who has to sit back here? Because as we saw when Casemiro was starting with Kobe Co- Co- Mainu, Mainu was starting to take up a more advanced role. He got his first goal against Newport, and then he scored against uh, Wolves a few days later. So Casemiro acting as that sentry that did allow Mainu to get forward and start to chip in with a couple of goals, one which was particularly important away to Wolves. But you're not going to necessarily have that balance with Mainu and McTominay, and it's it's likely that Mainu will be the one who has to take more of a backseat. But he's not a defensive player. I, I look at Kobe Mainu, who's still only 18. I think he turns 19 quite shortly. Um Maybe next week is it he turns 19. Uh, but I look at him and I see someone who could very, very easily develop into a playmaker uh, later on in his career. Maybe not even that later on in his career. Watching him, he's the, the play he reminds me of is, is Iniesta. And Iniesta, of course, 
a lot of people still associate him as a midfielder, but he played in the front three quite a few times for Barcelona. And you could see Maynu eventually making that transition. He's, he's that forward thinking. His dribbling ability is phenomenal. Uh, th- that great chance McTominay had at 1-0, that was procured through Maynu's footwork, mainly. He took two or three Liverpool players out of the game, played Rashford in. Rashford gives that ball back to McTominay. So Maynu playing higher up in time, I think that's going to be in United's interest to have someone who's going to be sitting and allowing Maynu to get forward. But for the run-in, depending on how long Casemiro is out for, it, it may be that Maynu is the one who has to take the back seat, um, particularly if McTominay is starting. And as I said, the, the ends justified the means against Liverpool in that he got a goal, he got an assist, he was in the thick of it. His, his athleticism was key as well in terms of ensuring that they had some some robustness for, for extra time, despite a lot of players around him flagging, understandably so, given uh, given what a, a taxing day it was. So it will be quite fascinating to see how United manage this period, dep- again, depending on how long Casemiro is out for. Um, but it, it's, you know, it's it's not great that Casemiro succumbed to this, this injury, again, having spent best part of three months out, I think it was, with a hamstring injury between November and uh, and late January. Yeah, definitely. And I think the thing as well that was quite interesting, Bruno Fernandes said during the internet, well, during this international break, I think over the weekend while he was away with the Portugal squad, that he could actually imagine himself in the future playing as in a more deeper role uh, yeah. a lot more a lot more often. And we saw it quite a few times last season when Eric Ten Hag decided yeah. to sort of pull him back a little bit and he, he he played in the number six role against Everton recently and he described it as what he thought was one of his best performances of the season. Obviously, like you said there, United are in a position where every result matters now between now and the end of the season. So there probably isn't a position where United can afford to take too many risks and trial that. So United, as you've said, Maynard quite rightly is a progressive forward-thinking player and in the future is likely to be a dominant figure in that number eight position, perhaps pushing into a 10 role. So it just leaves that difficulty of the number six for now. So... And it's awkward because obviously Mason Mount's looking to come back into the team as well. And thinking long term on Mason Mount, there may not necessarily be a, a role for him in what could be to Eric Ten Hag's first choice midfield three, presuming Fernandez stays at 10, Maynou plays an eight, and United get that defensive specialist. Yes, with I've read the the Fernandez quotes. I think Stephen um did our version of them. And he when he referred to that Everton game, I, I couldn't I, I assume he was, as you said, George, referring to the the, the last league game they had. But he was yeah. he was excellent against Everton last season at home. And I think they clearly like looking at it on paper of this recent game, you'd have had him down as the um probably on the right, I think would it have been, because I think Hoyland was still out. Uh, just looking at the team now, Casemiro, Maynou, McTominay all starting. So you'd have probably thought McTominay at, at 10, Fernandes on the right. But he did start definitely as one of the two central midfielders against Everton last season and was brilliant. And there were times in the recent game where he was taking up that position, clearly because they knew they had a lot of joy against Everton at home last season. And Everton were managed by Sean Dyche at that time as well. It wasn't like they were coming up against... Frank Lampard's Everton and they just essentially it was like do what you did last season and of course he did and um, he, he was one of United's best players in a pretty unmemorable game that that win recently against Everton and it was mainly remembered for you know, Garnacho's performance and, and getting the two penalties but there have been times recently where you know, discussing with with colleagues about Fernandez, and you know there was merit when they had issues in midfield to putting him back there and maybe playing McTominay as the 10. And that's something that, of course, is, is an option for them uh, in the run-in. Fernandes, I thought he produced a, another captain's performance against Liverpool, just the sheer the selflessness and, the um, again, the durability of, of him. Never missed a United game through injury, which is absolutely remarkable. And he's gone away on international duty and, did he get a goal for Portugal last week as well? Yes. I think he did. Yeah. Uh, you know his his mentality and his his mentality and desire are two. If you're doing word association with Bruno Fernandes, those are two words that that come up. But I would I would be certainly you know open to seeing him playing in in, in a deeper role. 
um, in certain games and the run in when that will happen imminently is is difficult to it's it's I don't think there's necessarily a game coming up where you'd say yeah put a put a circle around that that fixture in the calendar to, for Bruno Fernandes to play there on that day he's he's one of the fittest players in the squad as I said he's never missed a game through injury for United they don't have an out and out alternative at number ten. And when they did have options earlier in the season, nobody thought, well, okay, you know, give Hannibal Meshbury another go. Meshbury kind of failed his audition. Donny van der Beek, you know, he's still a Manchester United player technically, but he's not a Manchester United player. So it does have to be Fernandes there. But if he can work, you know, if if they can if he if if some telepathy develops between him and a teammate who can who he can switch with, possibly. And I know it sounds very easy in principle, and it probably isn't. But I don't see any reason why he, him and Maynou couldn't rotate, possibly. Because as I said, Maynou has looked very good when he's got further forward. And I think he will become a much more attack-minded midfielder for the time being in his role. It's absolutely right the way he's playing, just operating uh, United are a team that really struggle to have control of the ball. And when Maynou's on the ball, you feel like they've got control. And that's that's remarkable for an 18-year-old to have that poise. But that is, we're, we're talking about someone who could, should, hopefully um, develop into a world-class player for Manchester United in England. But United have got to. I, I don't see it as a problem for United, even though Casemiro, the Casemiro injury is a problem. But in terms of Fernandez and the option of McTominay or Fernandez or Maynou or Christian Eriksen, I thought did very well when he came on against Liverpool. Amrabat is an option as well. Mason Mountain signed as a central midfielder. They have got a lot of options there. And among those options, there must be a solution for the upcoming games if, if Casemiro isn't uh, available for them. If Casemiro is available, then you maximise him and you make the most of the balance that he he should offer as as a defensive midfielder. But in a season where United have had more than 50 separate cases of injury or illness that have contributed to players missing games, it's, it's, a, it's a good position for them to be in where they've got five or six central midfielders still to choose from. Yeah, there's definitely spoke, uh, scope rather for Eric Ten Hag to work his way around this particular puzzle and find a solution. But speaking of Koi Mainu, he of course got that England debut on, on Saturday evening, that 1-0 defeat to Brazil at Wembley. Stored 15 minutes under his belt. Didn't do anything too flashy when he came on, but looked quite composed, quite comfortable and could quite easily back a first start when England played Belgium on Tuesday night. I thought he acquitted himself really well. England seems to have this uh, stuffing knocked out of them when... Uh, when they went 1-0 down. And after that, I think Brazil just assumed control and England kind of waved the white flag. It was almost as if the, they, they didn't have anything in, left in them to to try and uh, salvage anything from the game. And they didn't really create many chances during the game either. I thought Brazil, uh, it, it wasn't your the, the glamorous Brazil performance that many might have expected or might have hoped for, but it was... You know, I thought their game plan and the way they executed it was very impressive. They created the better chances as well. By far, they were they were worthy winners. But I thought it was quite telling that, given the the relationship between Manchester United fans and England fans, and how touchy it can be, and how a lot of United fans don't don't care about England, and there's always been antipathy towards the national team. When Maynou came on, it sounded like it was possibly the loudest cheer of the night from the England fans and that's because people want to watch him that he's I've said before I, I love watching him play he's, he's such an exciting player to um to be present for at games and seeing the flesh and just admiring his footwork and admiring his his development and again I know I've said it before ad nauseum but from from the MEN's perspective having watched him since he was 16 and you invest in sending you know, reporters to youth league games, to EFL trophy games, to youth cup games, and you you essentially track the development of special players. And Mainu certainly caught my eye a couple of years ago watching him in the youth cup, and I've been fortunate to see all of his all of his first team games so far. And there's even though you have no no direct relationship with him, there, there is a sense of of pride and 
um, joy at just seeing such a young young player um, fulfilling his potential and, and doing so well. And I, I don't, I, I, I've not come across the quotes as to why Southgate bumped him up to the senior squad after the Liverpool game. But a cynic might suggest, well, if he's been linked with Man United's manager's job, then he, he best get Kobe Mainu in the in the England squad and, and familiarise himself with him. But I understood Southgate's uh, original rationale for not picking him. Yet, if you look at England's midfielders, is Kobe Mainu one of the three best England midfielders? He is. He's one of the best midfielders in the country at the moment, and he has been for a few months. And the, the what was so um, significant about his performance against Liverpool was that that was one of the quirks about his the quirk about his form was that he wasn't really producing memorable performances at Old Trafford. And then was it worth the wait? It was worth the wait. He did it against Liverpool in an FA Cup tie. And it really does him a disservice that he came off the pitch with United 2-1 down in the final 10 minutes because it it almost gives the illusion that he was sacrificed um, because he wasn't wasn't cutting it at all. But he he was he was terrific. And I did. I had a slight concern when he was coming off that just because of what had happened earlier in the season with Hoyland coming off a couple of times and there being boos, that there might be boos at Maynou coming off. But fortunately, he got a standing ovation and there was understanding that this kid is just knackered. Uh, he needs a rest. Um, and and we, need, we need another forward on the pitch to, to try and salvage the game. So... Uh, there was, you know, there was progress made there in the sense that United fans completely understood why this great white hope of theirs was being taken off, even though they were two one down in the game. And uh, in, in all honesty, in terms of the England game on Saturday, I very, very rarely sit through England friendlies from start to finish. But one of the reasons I did watch it at the weekend was because there was a good chance that. Manu was going to come on for his debut, and it'll probably be the reason why I um why I watch tomorrow night's game against Belgium. Uh, so hopefully, hopefully for for us, he he does start. Yeah, fingers crossed. And from our point of view, we're obviously really keen for him to express himself with England and develop quite quickly. But I think there is a legitimate case, provided he finishes this season in the form he's been in recently, for him to be part of that England midfield three at the Euros with Jude Bellingham and Declan Rice. I think that number eight position is up for grabs and he is tailor-made for it. Well, on form, I, I think he's probably the the best candidate to go in there because Gallagher's playing further ahead for Chelsea. He's playing behind the striker there. I don't think he had a particularly good night against Brazil. Bellingham, of course, is, is going to be the playmaker. Rice is an absolute certainty. Calvin Phillips is now out of the picture, uh, which is quite ironic since he left to play regularly and... Playing, in playing regularly, he's, he's regularly made mistakes, and that's in, that's seen him uh, get dropped by by Gareth Southgate. Um, who else? Uh, Jordan Henderson is is he's probably as unpopular as that cross on the back of the uh, the England shirts at the moment with England fans. Uh, he he shouldn't be in the squad for a myriad of reasons, and that dates back to the the start of the season. And I don't think that. Playing in the Saudi Pro League and the Eredivisie uh, over the course of the season is is good preparation for for a major tournament. So I, I think there's actually infinite logic in going with Mainu, and I don't think his rawness really comes into it either. If anything, international football is is easier. To, it's certainly in terms of playing it, it's easier for the best players because it's it's a little bit more sedate. It's not as frenetic as the Premier League. And this is a kid who Everton away passed the test, Liverpool away passed the test, Liverpool at home passed the test, Istanbul away um, during his cameo, really impressive. He's gone to Wolves away, Villa away, all these away grounds, all these tests, um, some some real bear pits as well. As I said, playing in Istanbul and that didn't with a lot of with a lot at stake for United. Nothing phases him. So and we know how sanitised the atmospheres are at um, international games, particularly tournament games, where it's not it's not out of the ordinary to see fans from both teams sat or stood among each other. It's quite um, it's quite cordial. You know, there's this goal music that goes on, which I don't think either of us would be fans of. So, it, although there's a lot 
you're playing for, and there's a hell of a lot of pressure, of course, playing for England. I I don't think there's as much pressure, or would be as much pressure that as as Mainu is under when he plays for Man United. And look how phenomenally well he's he's doing playing for United. He's he's one of the he's, he's won the Player of the Year uh, award nominees, and that's in spite of him missing pretty what, the first first three months of the season. So I, I'd I'd have no problem with him going straight into that team just because who are your three best English midfielders? Well, it's Bellingham, it's Rice and it's Maynou. So if he keeps it up for the rest of the season, if he does well against Belgium, that that could well be his place in the team. I certainly can't disagree with that. And that does conclude part two of this Manchester is Red podcast. We'll be back in part three to very briefly look at the latest injury news ahead of the weekend's trip to Brentford. Welcome back to part three of the Manchester is Red podcast. As I said a few moments ago, we are going to quickly gloss over the latest on the injury front ahead of that trip to the capital at the weekend. And Samuel Lissandro Martinez could be a potential candidate to return this weekend. He went away with the Argentina squad during the break, didn't play, but uh, did go and train with them, which bodes as a positive ahead of this coming week in preparation for that trip to Brentford. And if he returns, that is a very, very significant player to have back for the running for Eric Ten Hag. Yes, he, he went away with them in September as well, even though he came off against Arsenal in United's last game before the September Internationals with an injury which turned out to be a, a complaint related to his metatarsal that was required a second round of surgery in, in late September. So the United's version at the time was that it's it's good for him to go away and be with his countrymen, be with the national team, be in that environment. Um, as it is for the English players, clearly the English players really buzz off rendezvousing with the staff and their teammates at international level at St George's Park. And sometimes in recent years, it's it's been escapism for United players when when things have not been too good um, closer to home. And like, I think if if Martinez is if if he is fit, then logically. You put him back in the team. I mean, Rafa Varane, of course, will start this weekend. Uh, Johnny Evans has been carrying a knock. Whether he's recovered or not, we'll probably discover on Friday. Harry Maguire's now come out of the England squad with uh, with an injury, so he won't play against Belgium again. The extent of that of it, it, I don't think that's that's uh, emerged yet. Lindelof is an option, but if you've got if you've got Martinez, who's Fully fit and fully recovered, then it's it's a no brainer. He he has to start, and it would be interesting to see how how he would cope. Because of course, last season at Brentford, uh, he was hooked after a half with with United four 0 down, and I think it was the third goal. He was a little bit all over the place for at the corner when when Ben Mee scored, and he, he you know he was a real culture shock for him. And then what was it? Nine days later, he was he was Herculean against Liverpool, and that was his breakthrough performance. So, the sooner he's back in the team, the better. But United have have done very well without him. When you look at their results, he got injured in that West Ham game. So they've what is it, is it eight games he's missed, I think, and they've won six and lost two. Got to the FA Cup semi finals. It's, it's just the one full. The one game that really sticks in the craw is is the Fulham one because they really should have been they should have been beat winning that game for a number of reasons and it's no disrespect to Fulham who of course had a very very good result against Tottenham quite recently but United have by and large done pretty well without Martinez but they are a better team with Martinez and they've not had him anywhere near enough not just this season, but pretty much over the last year nearly. It's, it must be coming up to a year since he fractured his metatarsal against Sevilla in the Europa League. And his absence has, has probably been the biggest absence all season um, because he's he's as much of an asset in attack as he is in defence with his, with his passing. And he, he improves players around him as well. I think that was apparent a couple of times last season when the, the Leeds away game really st- sticks out when I think Luke Shaw starts at centre half with Harry Maguire. Martinez came on at nil nil. Shaw went to left back. Martinez was obviously at centre half. His passing was excellent. His passing range was excellent. Shaw crossed in for Marcus Rashford's winning goal that day. 
and that's that that's just what Mars another pro of having Martin is in, in your team in that he he does radiate confidence. He's not just a very confident footballer and a very good footballer and a very good defender, but he does improve those next to him. Yeah, he certainly does. And we saw a prime example of that, certainly in recent weeks when United won 4-3 at Molyneux, when Marcus Rashford and Luke Shaw started down the left. Martin is in that left-sided centre-half position. Those three, the combination play was very impressive. But of course, Luke Shaw still absent. So Martin is, like you said there, Samuel, he, he does bring a hell of a lot more than just defensive traits to this team. Yes, yeah. There's, I, I, I think maybe in, in his first few games, I remember when I went to... I think his first appearance was against Real Vallecano uh, in, in the friendly. And then, of course, it was Brighton. And and then, obviously, after that, it was the Brentford game. And I was I was sat with three different different colleagues for those games. And all of them said exactly the same thing, which was Martinez is tiny. And that it was difficult not to be taken aback by his height when he first started games for United. But since that Brentford game, his, his height hasn't been mentioned whatsoever. And of course, Brentford will have almost certainly um, Ivan Tony starting and, and Neil Mope, who I don't I don't remotely rate as a striker. I think he's probably one of the worst Premier League strikers I've ever seen, but he does try and make himself a nuisance. And he, he does, he's, he's quite a truculent character as well, but that's the kind of character that you want to pit against Martinez because Martinez will hold his own against anyone he's not going to be intimidated so as I said United are a better team with him and he's, he's whether it's Saturday or whether it's next week uh, his his return should be imminent hopefully fingers crossed he, he doesn't have another setback fingers crossed that would be a huge blow for United to lose him again or is obviously already without Luke Shaw and Martinez of course has missed large chunks of this season but that does bring an end to this episode of the Manchester is Red podcast. A big thank you to Samuel for joining me. As always, if you've enjoyed listening to this episode and would like to watch it as well, we are now on YouTube, of course. Just search Manchester is Red and make sure you subscribe to the channel. We'll be back again on Friday to build up to Saturday's trip to Brentford. Before that, though, make sure you check out a special episode with darts player Nathan Aspinall, who was once scouted by United as a youngster as he pursued a career in football. Stephen Railston, our colleague, caught up with him last week and that podcast will be coming your way on Wednesday. But until then, have a great week and we'll catch you again very, very soon. <laughs> <laughs>